Uh, hello and welcome to the 49th edition of New Directors, New Films, presented by Film at Lincoln Center and the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, my name is Tyler Wilson. I'm an assistant programmer from Film at Lincoln Center, here with the directors of our second shorts program in the festival. Uh, thanks very much to each of you uh, for your films and for allowing us to share them with our audience online before the year's out. Uh, and of course, a thank you to our viewers for tuning in. Um, maybe to start things off, uh, I'd like to give each of you the floor to introduce yourself and your film. Uh, and tell us where you are in the world right now and maybe what you've been up to these past few months. Um, Augustina, we can start with you. Hi everyone, my name is Agustina Gomedi. I'm uh, the director of Playback. Um, I'm in the middle of the mountains in Córdoba, in a very small town. Um, we've been in a very long lockdown. It's been eight months already. So uh, I've been developing my next film that, uh, from my place. I couldn't move anywhere. <laughs> Hey, I'm, I'm Steffen Goldkamp. I'm the director of uh, After Two Hours, Ten Minutes Had Passed. I'm currently in Hamburg, where I live and work. And yeah, for the past past months, I have been doing not much, but, but writing, and not watching films from home, unfortunately. So yeah, that's what I'm doing, not much. Um, hello, I'm Simon Liu. I made um, Happy Valley. Thank you very much to Lincoln Center and MoMA for having me in this film. I really appreciate it. Um, for the past few months, I've, I've been in New York um, and I've been editing my first feature film as well as working on my first video installation piece that is kind of in the same vein as this film that's screening this program. Um, and yeah, I'm wishing that I could go back to Hong Kong at some point soon, kind of return to the place that I've been making my films, but soon enough, hopefully. Um, I'm Arda Chiltepe and uh, originally from Istanbul, but now I live and work in Hamburg. I'm the director uh, of Black Sun. Um, I wasn't, yeah, the, like Stefan, I wasn't so much doing so much. I mean, I was just watching films and uh, reading is just the usual stuff. Um, yeah. I was actually watching mainly John Ford films for the last, since the quarantine actually, since March, and that I'm enjoying. And I will probably keep, keep doing on. Uh, hey everybody, I'm Keisha Ray Witherspoon, director of T. Uh, I'm currently in Hollywood, Florida, just back from Jamaica actually. I miss it. <laughs> And um, for the past few months, I've been writing my first feature. Well, uh, thanks again, uh, everyone, for joining us. Um, uh, you know, in rewatching your films, uh, I think uh, the impact of loss or or some kind of irrevocable change was was on my mind, especially now. I mean, I I guess these days. Any film made before March 2020 might remind us of the things we've lost, but I do think your films um, in particular are engaging with this idea on a fairly direct level. Although each of you take uh, really different and interesting formal approaches to this idea, but also many other ideas that each of your films are, are um, dealing with. Um, Augustina and, and Keisha, uh, maybe I could start with you two because uh, your films are both playing with the nonfiction mode, uh, the archival film with playback and uh, the verite approach for tea. Um, but they're both also leaning into the, uh, into the fantasy element of, of film, um, maybe to get at a larger truth, maybe about, um, or about remembering or about understanding someone's grief. Uh, so I, I'm wondering maybe to start us off, if, if each of you could uh, tell us how you arrived at this particular documentary aesthetic for your films? Uh, I start? <laughs> um, okay, I, um, I started working with um, this group of archives that belong to Palace Group, but it's a group of, most a group of performers that did their, their playback, their lip syncs in 
after the military dictatorship in Argentina in 80, 1983. Um, one of them, the one that, that tells the story, uh, was my father's former um, couple. So um, I arrived to these archives and I, want, I knew I wanted to work with them because I, I, I was working with, they appeared when I was uh, doing my first feature film. And there was like a, this idea about AIDS and, and how this, this AIDS hit the, the LGBT population really hard and how the, the military dictatorship hit them very hard too. So, but this idea of happy endings keep coming on to me, like the, the, impo the, like the impossibility of happy endings for them. And so I decided this, this idea up here of, of having a small fiction uh, inside this, these archives, because it's, an, it's a hybrid film, uh, which could do some kind of justice for them. Inventing, creating happy endings, uh, they deserve like the happy endings they deserve. So uh, I worked in this idea of a queer archive. It's like um, an imaginary archive uh, and question the the idea of truth and reality and what's an archive and what's what's not an archive. Uh, that's how the, the the form of the film appears. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm going to maybe butt in with a couple of questions, specific questions real quick, but um, could you talk about your collaboration with your narrator, La Delpi, um, in relation to this, this bigger idea? Because uh, La Delpi is revisiting this, this very real period um, in their life, but you're also fictionalizing it to an extent as well. Um, so I'm just curious what that collaboration was like making the film? Well, we, we have a very close relationship because of what I told you before. Uh, she was my father's former couple. And um, we were, I, I went to her house and we watched the archives together. Like we did this many times. And while she was watching them, she talked a lot and I took notes. Um, and I, I discovered every time she changed the story like she talked about one of her friends they were all dead uh, already she was like the, the survivor um, and she changed the, the stories like one time one of them had a very um, i don't know a, a boyfriend in bahamas and she went there with him and the other time she had i don't know like all the time they were changing. And I realized that this was like her little revenge for those terrible endings they had. So I, I wrote down, uh, completely based, her, her voiceover is completely based on things she said before. But I like put all that together. I, I did the whole editing of the film and then she, she recorded uh, a text that like what was written but it was based on on this experience with previous experience and so um what was it like for you to shoot the original footage in relation to the 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 footage that you were at the, the archival footage that you were actually working with the materials what um what sort of what were the main questions that you had as you were filming it um and to what degree was let Del be involved in, in that, or was she at all? Um, well, the, the first big question was if it was like an ethical question about, about the archives. I, I wanted that to be part, like, um, I wanted to be VHS, I wanted to have a similar look, but I didn't want it to be like confused as uh, the original archive. So this was solved by the, the voiceover like she announced that it's a fantasy it's a fantasy so you can read that in key. but it was very important for me sorry for the wind 
um, it was very important for me that we had the same group because I realized that her memories were like VHS memories because she'd seen so many times these archives, like she'd seen those shows so many times that her memories look like them, you know, they, they are part of them. She, she can't tell what's her imagination, what's inside the, the images, like she sees one once again and again. So yes, it was very important that for me that it didn't, that it wasn't too different, you know. It had the look of the this 80s look, this 80s atmosphere. Um, I'll, I'll hop, hop back to you. Um, first to go back to that original question I posed of how you arrived at this kind of verite look to the film, but also just sort of to tag on to the last question I asked to Augustina is just also, yeah, how you, how, what ideas were you bringing to, to this approach uh, of, of filming in a, in a documentary way with, with your actors? Uh, yeah, I, um... Well, so many, the characters really are embodiments of a shared truth, I think, in, in the Black community. And so I wanted to, I felt like Doc Style was just like a really useful tool um, to just capture the reality of, of the community. Um, but, you know, also it was a useful, it was a useful tool in terms of like when the media shows up, which is usually this sort of the gaze, the G-A-Z-E, you know, of it all, and just um, wanting to confront that a little bit as well. Um, not a little bit, a lot. <laughs> Each character confronts the gaze at some point um, in their own way. And so um, just uh, in terms of, of, of the, the way that I wanted the um, emotions to resonate with the audience, I thought, this is the best way to really to really showcase this and as, as opposed to fiction. Also a lot of aspects of the film, I mean, everything you see there is based in reality. Um, everything from the t-shirt designs, which is a very common type of memorial in the community. I mean, it's actually like replaced black at funerals now. Um, down to, and I don't wanna give anything away necessarily, but if, I don't know if this is screening before or after, but. Um, Speak about the film as if people okay yeah great well um you know even the scene with the embalmed body that's based on an actual tradition primarily in puerto rico but it's made its way to um the south in the united states and so um yeah these things that are sort of seemingly maybe bizarre to some people are strange are um just sort of uh otherworldly are you know, truths of these communities. And so I felt this is actually sort of a doc in its own way, you know, mm -hmm. um, in terms of the characters uh, in a very organic sense, like they all had experiences with this. And so they brought that to their performances, which, you know, looking back, they were really, you know, the feedback I've gotten to about the performances is that they were pretty natural. And I was really, really happy with um, the result. Yeah, I mean, in talking about how so many pieces of this film are grounded in, in reality, that you are also um, bringing in other, really otherworldly elements where we see this footage of of nebulas toward the end and all this, this these sort of space sequences and there's a science fiction bent behind the film as well to some degree. And I, I'm curious when or, or how that, came into the picture and uh, if you were looking to certain like science fiction or genre filmmakers for visual or oral inspiration. Yeah, I'm, I'm always jealous. Well, most of the time jealous of the sci-fi films because I don't really see um, that many black sci-fi films, you know, or fantasy. And so I just, uh, and, and it's my favorite. <laughs> I love it so much. And so um, for me, it's important in my work to just sort of create an access point, like to allow, you know, and, and, and envision um, people of color in that world, in that realm. Um, it's, 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 I think also for me, it serves the purpose of being 
the ultimate transcendence. Um, I feel like the transcendence is grounded in joy on earth, like in many parts. That's why it's a celebration. That's why it's a ball. Um, so I'm not, I don't want to create a, a, a sort of environment where we're trying to disembody or disengage from being here. There is joy that's here that we, we express, whether it's the flamboyance, the music, the culture. Um, but um, the same way that you see a sort of access for everyone else, you know, to the cosmos, I wanted to create that in the work as well. Um, maybe one last question um, specifically about your film. Could you talk about uh, like the costumes that we see in the film? They're like really incredible um, from the potato chip bag to the, the, the red and blue light suit. Can you talk about uh, creating that? Who, who created that? Um, um, what was the, the process behind that? Uh, very random, arbitrary ideas in my mind. Uh, um, just the, the potato chip suit was random. Um, but uh, in terms of like, I, ha I do piece things together in a strange way. Like I was thinking about a lot of uh, deities. I thought about Isis and I, I wanted to have a sort of winged goddess-like uh, uh, presence in the film. And so I married that with with her relationship with her son and that that sort of arbitrary like uh, indulgence or, of his, which is which is the potato chips. Um, the red and blue suit very specifically uh, ties into the concept of the binary. Um, and um, I utilized red and blue in terms of Americana and that those two colors representing the binary politically, um, you know, aesthetically. And, um, and that's why toward the end, I have the, the nebula sort of meld into this sort of like violet, violet color, which was just sort of my symbolic representation of, of uh, removing ourselves from the binary and sort of like an amalgamation of the two um, piece, you know, in a sense, in my, in my mind, it was a visual representation of that. Um, but, but as a continuation with the, with the costumes, I mean, this, it was an actual ball. We had a ball, um, people came, came and they made their own costumes. I also worked with a great costume designer named Mumby O'Brien. Um, and so we just uh, all, it, it was a collaborative event. My mother is even in the film. She's who's wearing the sort of plastic couture gown that she made herself. I had no idea she was even gonna show up. Um, originally there was a lot more about the environment in the film that we ended up cutting out, but that, that was the inspiration for her piece. Uh, yeah, it's a really, moving film and really incredible production design all around. Um, uh, Simon, I'll, I'll hop to you because you know, your, your film's also towing with the sound and the image of, of documentary footage uh, with your film, it's footage of Hong Kong. Uh, the film is obviously filmed or, or at least constructed around the time of uh, the protests, but it's fairly oblique within the film. I, like. To me, it, watching it, it, it's more of a piece with the larger pace of a city that's always changing or moving. And even though at that point in time, it might be a little worse for wear. Um, so I, I'm curious, what was on the like the forefront of your mind as as you were collecting and and I guess eventually manipulating this footage? And and maybe I guess tell us exactly when uh, this footage is from. Um, well, I mean, I've been making films about Hong Kong pretty much for the entire time I've been a filmmaker and my kind of identity and relationship is being a half Chinese, half English person in this former British colony and this sense of since Hong Kong was handed back to mainland China from, the, from its colonial past in 1987, this idea of this kind of expiration date of this city and this place that, you know, has become so iconic in so many ways globally. Um, and so I think a lot of my previous works have been kind of functioned as a kind of a repository to kind of capture as much visual information, cultural information of this kind of place that is under some form of disappearance as it's kind of over time merging with the mainland. Um, and so in so many ways, my work was about kind of dealing with this hypothetical idea of a city and a people literally disappearing over time. Um, however, over the past you know, 18 months, this kind of um, this kind of thing that was once this very like hypothetical or like projected idea of the future has become 
increasingly like a real reality, you know, and to see um, how much the city's changed over the past 18 months with the protest movement and how it's been cracked down upon since. And so, I mean, I think this, alongside with two previous works, Signal 8 and Force, which both screened at Lincoln Center in the past year, um, I've been kind of dealing with this idea of taking images of Hong Kong and the spectacle in the city, but kind of creating a sense that things are almost teetering on the edge as though things are on the verge of changing irrevocably. Um, and so the film, was the, the Happy Valley was shot in, um, in July and August of 2019 and November of 2019. So two very different parts of the protest movement. In the summer, that's when the protest movement kind of first began. And there was like this semblance of a potential for the future. This kind of idea of, of the protest movement actually almost had been succeeding to a certain extent. However, by the time it reached November, that's when the city had really fallen apart in so many ways. And I was there visiting, visiting wanting to go home, so I live in New York. Um, and I felt this urge to go back during that time because I could see on my phone, like on the news, see how much the place was falling apart. Um, and so when I was there in November, there was a siege at Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Um, a lot of, there was a big crackdown on the protests. And since then, the movement has really kind of dissipated because of certain, certain fears for people's future and participating in the movement. Um, and so the film, I kind of wanted to make a, a protest film that kind of looks at things, but kind of is also kind of looking in the other direction, you know, like kind of being, um, images of spaces that I would never imagine my body actually occupying. You know, like one of the images on, is on the, one of the main highways, freeways in Hong Kong that I would never imagine, you know, growing up there, I would never imagine myself actually standing in that place, you know, but there's this like the sense of a kind of, this kind, these kind of conflicting feelings around this, the movement and around the involvement in the protests. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the film is, has very many documentary elements to it, but it's also like a highly subjective kind of documentary that's like very, very much intertwining my own personal memories growing up in the place, this place that has like made me who I am and has made, as, as an artist, as a person in so many ways, and how that conflicts with um, the, the British colonial monuments that you see throughout the film in conflict with kind of, um, a city that's been changed irreversibly, you know? So I have a lot of like mixed feelings of the film is kind of shifting around. And I think, I you know, Happy Valley is the name of um, an area in Hong Kong, but I kind of, I thought like, you know, there is, this is, this film is about like, in so many ways is about happiness and whatever kind, you know, and kind of like the search for happiness in a place where, where it seems like that's almost something that's like of the past almost in a way. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, I mean, you kind of you kind of touched on it a little bit, but yeah, I, I, your film especially, I feel like we would be having a much different conversation about this film if we showed it in March. But you know, I mean, since then, obviously, the pandemic has consumed like every every aspect of national and international news, and um, and during this time, China there was a relatively forceful crackdown from China on the protests. So I, I'm just, and, you, and you, you even already have another film in the can um, after this, uh, this one. And so I'm just curious uh, uh, how you, of your thoughts on this film now, it, how it, your relationship has changed to it in the months since. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really interesting question. It's something I watched again and like, a number of times. And this is something that really come, like, I've been thinking about it a lot because there was as you said, this was supposed to show in March. Like, completed it in January, and even there's a shot of a face of a face mask in the film. And on October first of two thousand nineteen, um, Hong Kong went under some form of martial law, where essentially they banned face masks. They made it. They made it so like in, or they banned the use of face masks to try and prevent people from hiding their identities during protests. But then within two months, you know, it was mandatory to wear a face mask. It's it's incredible. Like you know, like the the. So my original intention in using that shot was to kind of emphasize this idea of like a remnant of a protest. But now just looking at that image of itself, it, it, the, the, what has transpired since kind of show, has signals to the hypocrisy of the idea of, you know, whatever kind of law that was put into place there. And um, 
Yeah, in, in July, and so the other film that you referred to, Tyler, it was, that film was finished after July 1st, which is when a certain legislation was put into place that really made illegal any form of subversion or any form of um, direct protest and made certain slogans and language, you know, illegal, essentially. Um, and so, I don't know, I think, I think in some, I think, I, I think what's really heightened for me is that I haven't, the last time I was there was in November when like a lot of really tragic things happened. Um, and it felt like the city and the people, the youth there particularly that were involved in the movement, um, it felt as though their lives couldn't go back to the way they were. It felt like life itself in the city couldn't back, go back to the way it was. And that was like my last experience of being there. And I normally go back like, once or twice a year. Um, my practice is like very much based around the city. Um, and so for me, just like, it, I feel that sense of loss and a sense of like dislocation in this kind of, these kind of confused feelings. And it's so much more heightened because I have have this like physical separation from the place, you know? Um, you know, like this idea of like all of these different things, the, the historical aspect, the contemporary news aspect in conflict with like my very, like, you know, my, with my own personal nostalgia, that's really come into the forefront of my thinking about this work. Um, and I, I think a lot of it also is like, you know, like, like the kind of guilt over having personal feelings and personal associations and like personal desires for a place to remain as it was, for a place to remain as a place of comfort and joy and how there's a sense of guilt in wanting that in the face of everything that has happened and in the face of all the loss that has happened, in the face of all of the struggle and the kind of irrevocable change. So um, kind of balancing that kind of like very personal aspect with with these larger questions has, is something that I really wanted to interrogate in the film. Like the film is about these little, like, you know, the pleasures of little things in the context of, of, of something that feels immense and ungraspable to myself personally. Were, were these, uh, was this like sent this need to kind of explore nostalgia sort of a guiding idea in your, in your musical choices too, or was there something else going on there? No, totally. That's a really great point. So all the music, it's taken like canto pop, Cantonese pop from like the 80s. And it's also like TVB dramas, like um, like the very famous like Hong Kong 80s soap operas that like people watch around the world, you know, like every Chinatown in the world to some extent is a facsimile of Hong Kong. So even though like Hong Kong as we've known it might be changing that like some like amalgamation and some distilled idea of the culture of Hong Kong is like, is very, is like, you know, has so much to do with like the way Chinese people view culture globally in so many ways. Um, and so I was very interested in kind of mishmashing. I, um, I used like a Roland four for a sampler and kind of used a lot of delay effects and a lot of abstraction of that original pop music and pop, like pop culture material in order to create a kind of an echo chamber of 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 the way that this place feels, of the way this place is sounded, um, and I think it's really in, like for me, I was like I was really driven to kind of to like have those like very like th th this nostalgic echo chamber kind of ring out in the face of all of these, you know. And I also think about this idea of like the the like the British colonial like statues like overlooking everything that's going on below, and how like how like this kind of mixing part of all of these different things coming together. Um, yeah, and there's a certain level of like, you know, it's a finance capital as well. This kind of Hong Kong is a place where like, where, where people around the world are kind of invited to come here and do business, you know? And there's this kind of, there's this kind of way in which people have wanted to like, those, that kind of community has wanted to like ignore the protest movement. They wanted, I mean, it's not too different to like corporate interests in America where people want to like, um, undercut certain political movements in order to just like keep maintain the status quo um and so i think i think a kind of like feeling of anxiety but a certain form of like anger towards that kind of mentality also kind of drove a certain aggressive quality that comes in the film but that comes back to like I, I'm very like mixed up with all these kind of thoughts but I feel like that's what the film is in so many ways it's this mix of these like yeah of these very like um yeah, we have a lot of different feelings and thoughts around the whole thing. Um, uh, Stefan, I'll, I'll turn to to you and your film. Um, I'm I'm curious about the ideas that that you brought to the 
the composition and, and sort of the the rhythm of your film as well. It's I mean it's largely composed of long uh, static takes where we don't uh, see the faces of of your actors. You're more so interested in capturing I think the the bare necessities of one's daily routine. Um, I mean it has an interesting effect on and I think the viewer to like to sit with these actions that I feel like we're all performing any given day, but um, whether it's sitting around mopping or, or fidgeting with uh, with something that you're holding, and I think it it has a really interesting effect to um, watch it on film and to sit with the actual duration of of these uh, these actions. And so, I, yeah, I, I'm curious. Um, Sort of how you how you found the atmosphere of this film and and thought about the composition in relation to the location, but also uh, the people you're filming. Yeah, um, the very very first time I, I I thought about this film was um, that I had this hypothesis to think um, that that prison always uh, appears in cinema very often, and there's always like something that is appearing in those films which I don't really believe because there's like cinema always points out like the big spectacle of things um, that happen in, in, in prison or it's just a step through something but there's not never really a present tense um, of, of being in prison and uh, that you can experience in cinema so um, like there there was like this kind of cliche that, that that's always demonstrated so I thought I, I tried to get in touch with uh, prison, uh, inmates and, and, and uh, I contacted this uh, juvenile prison and I had the chance to, to, to work with them. So I offered a seminar and we were looking at films together. And then I had this, I had a lot of questions how it would be to be in, in, in prison and um, what's their, their life, what are they doing all day long. So I, I asked them what it is and it turned out that um, each time we, we came closer to this topic of boredom, um, that there was like coming up a huge aggression in, in the room. So, and then you would ask like, yeah, what is that? What is that boredom and what are you doing? And then, then they just, yeah, I just smoke a cigarette. So yeah, but okay, you smoke the cigarettes, that's like five minutes. And um, so what, what are you doing afterwards? And then they say like, yeah, I drink a coffee. And then, yeah, okay, what are you doing afterwards and afterwards? And then bit by bit, they came up like this this state um, that they had to describe and that they had to explain to me in in the in the, in the most details and then with that there came a lot of aggression and like an enormous feeling and then we said like, okay this is really something that is um, seemingly the core of everything that you're experiencing here in prison so let's let's take a look at that together and let's try to reenact and stage those situations. And so that was the point where, where we were starting to develop the film, I think. Mm. Yeah, so you, you mentioned there is like a sense of aggression when I guess discussing what ended up becoming like the, the core subject of, of your film. So I, I'm curious what the, what the process was actually like uh, staging and and filming uh, each of your actors or and, or collaborators performing these actions or or repeating them in front of a camera um, was the anonymity element born out of uh, born out of this 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 sense of not wanting to show their faces doing these things or was this more of a I guess more of a legal question since you were in a prison yeah yeah. It was a legal question in the very beginning, like the first com um, conversation with the um, head of the prison was like, okay, so there would be no face, no name, nothing in it. And I thought, yeah, okay, I can live with that because maybe this is like a quest that brings, like or, uh, a thing that brings me closer to something that, that I can make visible or that I can, I can focus more on the body that is imprisoned. So, um, and how we work was, um, it was actually really technical um, after like after five months or something like that uh, there were like we had a lo uh, regular basis um, when we met and um, we spoke about everything like because I think they really enjoyed having me in the prison because I'm not like 
somebody who would judge over them or um, they could offer me some, they, they could just talk to me uh, like they couldn't talk to the other inmates or to the, to the officers there. So um, we had like the mo thing we did the most was were speaking like about all the shit that happens in the life and the daily life. And um, so, and after, like we had, for example, one hour to shoot um, with each inmate for one day. And then 55 minutes were, was a conversation about everything. And then was, it was like, okay, so we have now five minutes. And then they, there was a lot of trust. So they would um, let us go really close. And um, then we said like, yeah, okay, we just want to picture how you are sleeping or how you do this and that. And, and then we found a, a pole position together, which was, which had to the firm and which I had an idea of before. And then it was just an execution of this movement or of this pose of a body, I think. Hmm. My, uh, and, of course, there, there were also other things um, that were a little bit more complicated. I mean, there's this conversation in the beginning of the firm um, where I was asking, um, is there somebody who would, um, allow us to film a conversation with somebody important it was important to them so that we can uh, cover a phone call or, and then it was something different but this was always like this a uh, lot of closeness that um that we had in, in in before the actual shooting so that they could trust us in, in some way i don't know yeah I, I, well i mean i think that the closeness and i think that the intimacy that you develop with with each of them comes through in the actual um cinematography which is really incredible um i i'm not sure if, if you said this um already because my video skipped but um how, how long did the shooting process take mm, it's hard to say because this this prison is like it's not a place where you can just go and there's like a lot of obligations what to do and when to meet and then you're making up a date which is like which which doesn't happen then in the end so um i think there were have been 15 days of shooting or something but it was like over the course of one and a half year the whole process happened so every once in a while i would go and for the first um few meetings i was just there to to give a seminar with, like I offered a seminar to get access. Um, and then the shooting was like over the course of, of a year, I think. And then it was like in two weeks, you can come back for half a day and then you have two hours to shoot with the, with the inmates and one hour to just sit somewhere or you know, something like that. It wasn't a, like a day of shooting is not really a day of shooting because you cannot really access everything so easily. Right. Right. And have you been um, been back since you, you completed the film? Has anyone? Yeah, I have like there's there are a lot of stories I'm, I'm trying to write about, like I, I'm trying to make a, a feature film with, with the boys because um, it was really astonishing that I, I finished the film and um, like two of the guys went out and um, I met them by chance right outside my door. Um, and um, like they, four months later, I was reading that they made a series of robberies again. So they had been on trial for the past year, for the past eight months. And um, he's like back in prison for another five years almost. So um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm writing letters with them, but the communication is like really, it's not so easy anymore, especially with Corona. The situation for inmates in Germany is terrible, I think. But um, yeah, we tried to connect a little bit and um, to speak and to, yeah, I really want to, I, I, I really don't get how this, what are the reasons for this. So I try to get closer to them and I, I, I bond with the, uh, with the, uh, the gang of, of his, of these boys and try to, try to ask them what, what's, what's wrong and what's going on with, with yeah. um, their lives. Yeah, it's like a bit difficult with them. Have they seen your, have they seen the final film? Yeah, they had seen it. They were a little bit shocked in the, in the beginning, I think, because they expected something like, something cool or something more, yeah, credible, more credible. 
um, but then in the end, I think that the film became something like a lawyer for them, or I don't know if this is the right word, but I think um, they were happy because they could describe to the officers what they feel like sometimes. So I, I, they were happy with the, with, the, with the statement that it makes. Like this um, state of boredom or this solitude that they feel when everybody leaves the prison and they stay back alone. So the state in, in the prison or the, the sound there is not always like this in the film, like there's also happiness and joy. But in the evenings and I, it's getting in a, in, a, in a different state. And so this film helps to describe that for the officers and yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I think of your film, um, especially in relation to, to art, as um, I think both of your films are, are making or taking the passage of time as a, as a, a core subject with your film. But um, with Black Sun, I think, although it does make us pay attention to the passage of time, it's to a different effect. There is this, there is this sense of urgency, the fact that there's an impending storm, um, but Arda, you, you kind of shirk that feeling a bit by creating this relatively languid atmosphere of this man going back home. Um, I'm curious, I, well, I guess to start things off, I'm curious where or how these connections between a death, a storm, uh, an eclipse emerged for you um, for the film. Yeah, um, I think it gradually emerged out. I mean, in the beginning, I mean, the, the film had some uh, changes, like major changes when I was, I, when I wrote the first draft and then when we were working on the second draft with Julia Tilke, who was the co-script writer. And then when we were shooting and when, we were, when I was editing, kind of. But the eclipse was there. I was, I was wanting that kind of, because in Turkey we have this kind of, uh, impending uh, catastrophe feeling. I mean, I have at least. And for the eclipse, is, uh, when it happens, it's just interpreted as in many ways, actually, to affect daily life, uh, kind of superstitious, superstitiously. And I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to have that kind of as a background. And then and kind of establish this uh, journey because I was I was interested in road films, and I wanted to establish this journey which a character doesn't kind of that it's a bit uh, ambivalent whether he wants to reach or not. And then and then the when I was working on the script, and then came the death, and then came the. Uh, and the other things as well, but maybe all bef before all these also the locations were in my mind because I knew that he had to stop and this stops either has to serve to the whole film or it has to, I felt that it has to actually um, like um, enlarge this, you know, like also kind of fortify this feeling of you know, like arriving constantly, but actually not arriving. And yeah. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, I think like there's an obscurity as you kind of mentioned to, to all, all these themes and like a sense of mystery that, um, yeah, there's that conversation um, with the butcher where they're, they're sort of running through the various reasons for the storm, like with the eclipse and, and, and all of that. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm curious. Well, first of all, how, how long uh, was this shooting process for you? Because I, what really stands out um, to me in your film, especially is, is maintaining this, this sense of an impending storm um, from start to finish that, uh, it really almost does feel like you, you, you filmed over the course of just a day or so. Um, so could you talk about that process of, of, of filming um, in relation to just trying to create a sort of consistency out of something that is actually constantly changing and developing? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, the film took four days in Turkey and one day in Germany. Uh, in Germany, in Hamburg, we shot uh, crematorium scenes, but they were not so much included in the end. In the editing, I felt, I mean, I felt that they, that they didn't have so much space except uh, some middle, like in, in the middle of the film that there comes this kind of, um, this images uh, around the hotel. And we shot in four days. And actually the impending storm, finally that it wasn't there in the script because um, before heading out, because we shot some days and two days in Istanbul, and then we were heading out to this uh, island actually. And then in the Indian side of Turkey. And then there came the news that there was a storm happening. And then actually I remember that before heading, before. Uh, departing Istanbul, departing from Istanbul, we actually had a meeting with the whole crew uh, to decide whether we are going to shoot, go on shooting somewhere around Istanbul, you know, kind of copying the locations, or are we going to go to the Aegean side? And actually, uh, the, yeah, I mean, so the, the storm came later uh, when we were shooting. Um, we had, we kind of wanted to include that because it was, yeah, I think it was, it's it's nice to I, it's nice to be open to this kind of accidents, you know, like kind of creating a circumstance, as so that a fortunate accident will happen, and kind of register all that as well. And because most of the scenes were not written as it was shot, um, I can say like most maybe to to exaggerate it, but maybe like forty percent. And and somehow that's why and the shooting was kind of uh, let's say uh, covered with this kind of tension of um, uh, impending storm. Actually, first day we couldn't cross to the island because the ferries were cancelled, and then we decided to include that. You know, there there wasn't so much written anything about the uh, storm, but there was an ex eclipse because I knew that I wanted to use an eclipse. And um, yeah, it kind of came from the from the conditions of the shooting, actually. Yeah. That kind of feeling, you know, that kind of that kind of rush, and actually not rush so much, like like slow rush. So you um, you kept to the, the the original plans for your locations. That's correct. It's just that the yeah. The, yeah. the manner in which you shot changed within them. So, yeah, the I, content was we wanted to, we included, for example, that there's a storm. I mean, actually, it was really obvious we could have included more, which was to 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 our regret anyway, because there was really storm happening. But yeah, we included, and yeah. So I I'm I, so I'm curious if what your expectations were for for the tone of the film or or the shooting style um, before mm -hmm. this this. The storm came into the picture. I mean, I'm just curious to maybe uh, to tease out the differences of the final product and, and the original expectation. I mean, yeah, I mean, there, there's a um, there's a huge differences in between this this different stages with this film, which kind of actually scares me because I mean, it's kind of um, there's this huge gap. But I mean, for, for with the 60 millimeter, I wanted to. I, we wanted to work with with Julia. We were with the D, she was also the DOP, and we wanted to work with 16 millimeter for exactly this kind of this kind of quality because we felt that the tone of the film would actually fit this kind of um, like a certain yeah a certain kind of melancholy feeling, and um, and in terms of that's also we actually decided to use. I mean, kind of shoot in certain periods of time, like, you know, during the day, rather either it's sunset or it's uh, before the sunrise and the magic hour and kind of um, like, you know, and I think this, the light also gives the feeling of this, of the general, to the general tone of the film. And, but it would be, I, I can't say that, I mean, I force, foresaw the script to be so like kind of dense like a language in a way and it happened like kind of gradually um, I came to some realizations when I was shooting as well that how it's gonna be uh, how it's gonna be 
in the end. Like, you know, in terms of the takes, we didn't so much do takes, we didn't so much do shots. Of course, we didn't have so much money. We had only um, eight rolls, which is like 88 minutes. So we had to, yeah, we had to, we really strict work strict, strictly. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, the style, except the decision that it's going to be 60 millimeter because of its tone, because of its texture, um, came really gradually in terms of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think the, your shooting out on film really brings out the, the, the textures, as you say, but also, yeah, the, the, the kind of the blustery, quiet mood that the film has too. It's really beautiful. Um, um, but I think that's about all the time uh, we have for this, this Q and A. Um, I want to thank each of you again for uh, participating in this, for, for sharing your films and uh, for, for your patience as we figured out a new format uh, to show your works online. Um, so thanks again to each of you. Uh, stay safe and um, good luck with uh, your future projects, whether they're uh, a short or feature. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>